Little has been recorded about President Roosevelt's response in the 24 hours after the Japanese attack on American soil. Well, thanks to exhaustive research and new information provided by the FDR Library, a new special airing tonight on the History Channel offers a rare and surprising glimpse at the man behind the presidency and how he confronted the enormous challenge of transitioning the nation from peace to war. Historian Stephen Gillen is the author of the recently released Pearl Harbor FDR Lee the nation into war. He's resident historian of the History Channel and a history professor at the University of Oklahoma. We're so happy to say he's joining us today with details about Pearl Harbor 24 hours after. Good morning, Stephen. Thanks so much for joining us. Good morning. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Such an important day in history. And you know, when we talk about Pearl Harbor, we think back, communication was not at all what it is today. So, you know, the news was trickling in and it was so different than the way things would be now. What were those first pieces of information that FDR actually received? Well, at 1.47 p.m. on Sunday afternoon, December the 7th, Franklin Roosevelt is sitting in a study. Mm -hmm. He has a sinus infection. He's not feeling well. He's wearing some old uh, sweatshirt. <laughs> and uh, the phone rings, and it's the Secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox. And Roosevelt picks it up, and Knox says to him, the Japanese have just attacked Pearl Harbor. Uh. And uh, Roosevelt's first reaction was, no. Huh. Uh, he wasn't, he, at first, he didn't believe it. But he hung up the phone, and then there begins this sort of desperate search to get information, to find out exactly what took place. You know, there's no 24-hour news cycles. No. Uh, there's no Twitter accounts. There's right. no Facebook. And the information, so what happens is in Hawaii, you have Admiral Block, who's in, uh, the Navy officer in Hawaii. Right. He uh, sends information to San Francisco. That information then gets forwarded to the War Department in Washington. And then from the War Department, it goes to Admiral Stark, and Admiral Stark then starts sending information to the uh, the White House so there's this relay system and yeah. one of the sort of uh, uh, sort of interesting aspects of the story is shortly after one o'clock Roosevelt is simply desperate to find out what took place he doesn't sure. know how many Japanese aircraft carriers were involved he doesn't know whether the Americans have launched a counterattack how many people were killed so he's trying to get information so they get Admiral Block on the phone okay and uh, Admiral Stark in Washington he's asking him for information and Block doesn't want to tell him what had taken place and how bad it was because he was afraid the Japanese uh, were listening in on the phone conversation. Oh so goodness. you have this almost comical scene where you have the President of the United States who needs to, the Commander in Chief, who needs to make decisions yeah. and he can't even get information from his own military because they're afraid that the lines are being tapped because there's no secure lines. And it took oh hours. Gosh. I mean, it, I mean Roosevelt, for every ac accurate piece of information he received that day, there were five pieces of information that were inaccurate. And he had a sort through it all as he tries to make these decisions. The other thing he did in terms of news management sure. is he shut down all the communication from Hawaii. Roosevelt, once he realized how bad this was, uh -huh. he wanted to make sure that the White House was the only source of information because he didn't want the public to know right. just how bad it was. So well, he managed the news in a way that would be difficult to do today. Well, you said five pieces of inaccurate information, so it's got to be so scary as the Commander-in-Chief when something so brutal happens to your country. How do you, how do you, you know, really lay this information when some of it might not be correct. So it's got to be such That's a right. difficult situation and, and position to be in. And when you think of how well he actually did end up handling it, I mean, we have to be very grateful. Uh, there are so many things that you found in your research. I'm curious, what was the most surprising thing to you that we will find surprising? Well, there are a couple. I'll not mention one. Okay. Um, it, uh, it has to do with presidential security. Um, mm. I was fortunate enough that the Secret Service provided me with previously classified documents related to the uh, uh, security at the White House. Okay. And um, uh, what, I, what these documents show is that just how casual uh, security had been uh, <laughs> on the morning of December 7th. Roosevelt had a total of 25 people who were responsible for protecting him when he was in the White House. Now, they're working in shifts. Right. So at any given time, there's no more than six or seven people uh, protecting the president when he's in the White House. Oh my goodness. As of Sunday night, December the 7th, there's 125. And a lot huh. of the things, if you've ever been to the White House, it's a fortress now. There's sentry gates, there's armed guards, sure, there's yeah. bulletproof window. All that stuff went up in the hours after Pearl Harbor. Before Pearl Harbor, Ooh. people would come and lounge on the lawn, have picnics on the lawn. The Secret Service only protected the house, not the gardens. There was one policeman 
You know, they get the entrance going to the White House. There's one policeman there. There's no gate, no uh, barriers, just one cop who directed traffic going into the White House. Of course, all that changes, and it changes overnight. Oh, how and uh, so there's this report. It's one memo written by the head of the Protective Service Detail mm -hmm. that outlines all the very detailed changes that took place. And that was really surprising and shocking to me. It the is. other one little funny story is that, you know, Roosevelt did not have an armored car. And when he had to give a speech the next day to go to the Capitol, okay. the assumption was that there were going to be saboteurs out there trying to take a shot at him. Mm. So the Secret Service went searching for a, a, a bulletproof car, and they found one. Just one. And it was a car they had confiscated from Al Capone. Oh, my gosh. So, <laughs> Roosevelt, here you have the President of the United States about to give a speech to save the world from Nazism, sure. and he hitches a ride from one of America's most notorious gangsters. Notorious That's gangsters. Little, <laughs> one of these little fun little things you come across. Well, you know, those are the kinds of things we'll be finding out, I guess, by watching Pearl Harbor 24 hours after. Is there anything else you can tell us that we can look forward to when it airs tonight? You know, there's one other thing. I'll tease one other thing. Okay. You know that Franklin Roosevelt was sick that day. No. He had a serious sinus infection, and one of the things we discovered in the course of our research that he had a very unorthodox medical treatment that involved a, uh, a drug that is now illegal. Oh and my goodness. Watch, when you watch the show, you'll see what I'm talking about. Interesting. Well, so much great information. We're looking forward to so much more of it when the show airs tonight on the History Channel. Thank you so much, Stephen. We really appreciate you bringing a little history to us. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. And we'll be right back.